Okay, so good morning, everyone. Thanks to you diehards for coming on Erev Yom Kippur uh, with nothing else to do, no food to prepare for dinner tonight or for the breakfast tomorrow night, uh, or me, no sermons to write or service to go over, uh, but to think about the uh, Torah portion that's going to be read this coming Shabbat. So not even thinking about Yom Kippur, thinking about two days after. Uh, God forbid we, uh, we have the chutzpah to think that we'll be around after Yom Kippur, poo, 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 to be able to celebrate Shabbat. So that's the, the fear and awe that Yom Kippur uh, presents to us, that if we don't, if we don't pray with uh, uh, the most fervent of appeals, then uh, God forbid, uh, God will decide to not write us into the book of life. So uh, deal, deal with that superstition, that traditional belief with the idea that there will be a Shabbos after Yom Kippur, and this is what the Torah portion is going to be. So um, the portion is Ha'azinu. Uh, we could say the blessing for Torah study, Baruch HaTadonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Sherkitshanu B'mitzvot Tavet Sivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. The portion is Ha'azinu, found in Eitz Chaim on page 1185. Whatever edition of Chumash you have, look for Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And it's the, the portion is actually just the entire uh, I think, 52 sentences of chapter 32. Uh, just a note about class, which I said before I started to record, that uh, next Wednesday, just one second, one person coming in. Uh, next Wednesday is the second day of Sukkot, so no class next Wednesday, because it's Yontiv. And uh, good morning, Rita. And uh, so no class next Wednesday and no class the following Wednesday because that's Simchat Torah. So after today, the next class will be three weeks from now, the first Wednesday in November, uh, where we will be uh, looking at the portion Noah. So um, is that right? Yes, uh, it should be the portion Noah, yes. Uh, <coughs> uh, not November, October. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So what I wanted to uh, look at today is, uh, is this poem. Last week's portion, Vayelach, uh, ended with, um, just a second. Yes. Uh, on page 1177, chapter 31, verse 22. That day, Moses wrote down this poem and taught it to the Israelites. Um, and this poem is this poem, supposedly, that begins the portion Ha'azinu. So if we were looking at a Torah scroll, we would see that the portion itself written into the scroll is written very differently than uh, everything else in the Torah. In the Torah, you have straight lines going across with breaks every now and then for paragraphs or for a new portion. And then there could be a couple of line break in between each books, each of the books. Um, for Hazinu, the portion is written uh, differently. The line is broken in half and you have the first part of the line, then a big space and the next part of the line. And so the entire poem is written in that way. So no matter what Torah scroll you're looking at, no matter what tradition the Torah scroll was written, Sephardi or Ashkenazi tradition, no matter how old it is, new it is, this portion, the poem part of the portion has to be written in that way. A few words from the beginning of the line, then a big break, and then a, the few words for the end of the line. So you can't really tell, in the Eitz Chaim, the, the portion is written kind of like a Haftorah is printed with these shorter lines, as opposed to how the narrative is, if you just go, I don't know, to the end of last week's portion on 1179, this is how normally the Eitz Chaim prints 
the text of the Torah, but because it's a poem, it prints it in these kind of half lines. Okay, so that's that's number one. How the how the portion is is written in the Torah scroll itself. Now, just to the to the language itself, which is which is interesting. I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the very first verse um, and Moses's use of of language here. So, Ha'azinu Hashamayim va'adabera. Vetishma ha'aretz imrefi. Give ear, O heavens, let me speak. Let the earth hear the words I utter. So, uh, a word about biblical poetry, uh, which um, I've talked about before in other, when, when it has arisen in other portions uh, of the Torah. <coughs> Excuse me. So, when when um, when poetry is used in Hebrew, there's uh, there isn't a ch when we think of poetry in English, we think about uh, rhyming. And that that usually a poem, whether it's a limerick or some other kind of poem, the feature is that the words rhyme at the end of the line. Okay. Uh, in Hebrew poetry, there's no challenge to rhyming. Uh, it doesn't take, it, one doesn't show off one's skill and knowledge of Hebrew by being able to find words that rhyme because almost every word can rhyme with every other word just by making it plural. Okay, so if I take the word, uh, if I take the word uh, shulchan, and make it plural, you have shulchanot. And then if I take the word kise, chair, make it plural, kisaot. Automatically shulchanot, kisaot, rhyme, not a big deal. So the challenge for Hebrew poets then is to do something else with the language to transform it into a poem. So one could either, um, use the uh, numbers of syllables in the line, kind of come up with a particular rhythm and meter, which is a hallmark of medieval Arabic poetry, which then was, uh, he, which, was which influenced Hebrew poetry too. So the little bit I know about medieval Hebrew poetry in, in, two in one class I took in college, uh, one feature of it was the meter based on uh, the Arab, uh, Arabic poetry influence. Okay, there's that. The other is to do what our uh, author of the Torah does here uh, by come up, coming up with a topic that will be used in one half of the sentence and that will then be reiterated in the second half of the sentence. So give ear, O heavens, let me speak. Let the earth hear the words I utter. Okay, so Moses, by talking to the heavens and to the earth, saying, let me speak in both sentences, we have then the hallmark of biblical poetry. We find this in the book of Psalms. We have this uh, in other places throughout the prophets as well. When prophets speak, in their poetic way, they are doing this as well. They are saying the same thing twice, just in different words. And that's how poetry works too. Sometimes what will happen is that a verb from the first sentence will be matched up at the very end of the second half of the sentence. So in other words, if we look at this line in the Hebrew, ha'azinu matches up with vetishma. Hashamayim matches up with Haaretz. Haazinu, uh, give ear. Vetishma, listen. So the same word on the first half of the sentence. Same word for the second word of the sentence. Ada beira, uh, let me speak. The third word of the sentence. Imrefi, utterances of my mouth. 
this, the third word of the second line, right? So it matches up. If we divide the line A, B, C, the second half of the line would be A, B, C. Sometimes the Ha'azinu and the Vitishma would be reversed. So we could, we could write this, this line this way, Ha'azinu Hashemaim Ba'adabera, Imrei Fi Ha'aretz Tishma. If we did it that way, so you just have to look at this, and I and I reverse the second line, Ha'azinu Hashemaim Ba'adabera, would match up if I reversed it, Imrei Fi Ha'aretz Tishma. So if we were to match it up, it would make a cross. We would have Azinu, I can't do it this way. Uh, let me do it this way. The pattern would be one, two, three, one, two, three. So I have three dotted lines like that. Our pattern is, uh, just a second, making these arrows like this. The, our pattern is first word matches up with first word in the second half. There could be one, two, three, one, two, three. It could match up like this, where the, the first word of the line matches up with the last word of the last line. And it goes like that. Now, in Greek, that's the letter chi. Okay. And therefore, this I'm showing off a little bit from uh, a little bit that I've learned about this from rabbinical school. This would be a chiastic form of the line. Okay, so it doesn't happen here in Ha'azinu in this portion, but it happens in the prophets and it happens in Psalms. Where so in our portion we have this pattern: the first word of each half of the line matches, and the second word. And the third word match with each other, uh, but there is also this opportunity for matching as well that, to make this X pattern. Okay, so um, that's that's Hebrew poetry because rhyming doesn't work uh, is not a challenge in Hebrew. Um, then, um, okay, now we get yes, Jan, unmute yourself. So is that also why there's a lot of the the prayers that were written later that are um, alphabetic, where like the ah, first line starts right. with the aleph, and the and yes. they use that as a pattern because the rhyming thing wasn't going to be right, wasn't going to mean Absolutely. much. Coming up with acrostics is another feature of Hebrew poetry. So either using the alphabet, and then you know, and some of these prayers. The letter Samach is missing, and you have a letter Sin instead. So the poet is going by the sound of the letter as opposed to the letter itself. Ashrei is known for the letter Nun missing, um, and why, why that is, is a whole other scholarly debate. So you have alphabetical acrostics, and Psalm 119 is a, um, you got six, six verses for each letter of the alphabet. Uh, in uh, the book of uh, the book of Lamentations, um, chapters one, two, and four, each verse is for each letter of the alphabet. And then chapter three, you have three verses for each letter of the alphabet. Chapter five is not alphabetical at all, but there are 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. You got 22 verses in chapter five of Lamentations. So you have a different um, different uh, uh, different opportunities there with acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet. And then medieval Hebrew poets would also write their name into the acrostic so that Lachadodi, for example, is based on that. Shlomo Halevi is what each of the stanzas spells out, the first letter of each line, and it's Shlomo Halevi Alkabets who wrote that poem. So many of the Zmi wrote the songs for Friday night and Shabbat lunch are these kinds of uh, acrostics spelling out the uh, author's name. Uh, sometimes you'll have uh, uh, the, um, uh, a, uh, a patriarch or a matriarch um, spelled out. So like a biblical figure, 
uh, biblical figure's name is spelled out. So you have that in the Shochenad that starts the morning service. So I'm just looking in my Machsor, which I have on my uh, desk here. If we just look at Shochenad, right. So what our Machsor does for Shochenad is, uh, we can't see it here, and there we go. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to see, but the second word, so I'm going to do this with the Shabbat tune. Bifi Yasharim Tit Romam Uptivrait Sadikim Tit Barach Uvilshon Hasidim Tit Kadash Uvikarev Kedoshim Tit Halal. So the Yud, Sadi, Chet, and Kuf spells out Yitzchak. Now, what our Machsar does is rearrange these four words here and does this based on the Sephardi tradition of having these words here so that the second letter, the third letter of these words spells out Rivka. So you have Yitzchak and Rivka here. In the Ashkenazi tradition, the, these words are, do not spell out Rivka, but in the Sephardi tradition, they do so that it's usually Bifiyasharim, Tit Barach, Uvdivrait Sadikim, Tit. Well, see, see, now I don't remember by heart by looking at the words here. But that's what our Machsor does to make it Isaac and Rebecca in that part of Shochenat. So these acrostics are hidden, and sometimes they're alphabetical backwards. Um, so in. Um, in the Musaf Amida of Shabbat, uh, when uh, in the silent Amida, Tikanta Shabbat Ratsita Korbanoteha is how that prayer begins as we pray silently after the Kedusha. That prayer, Tikanta Shabbat Ratsita Korbanoteha, Tet Shin Resh Kuf, you're going backwards with the alphabet. Okay, as opposed to front words with the alphabet. So there, that, that poet who wrote that uh, prayer decided, oh, let's try to do this backwards instead of forwards. So a lot of different tricks that we have with the alphabet and with, that poets can use when they, when they utilize acrostics. Okay, so all that uh, being said, let's, let's look now to the phrase itself. Why is Moses calling on heaven and earth? in order to ask permission to talk, right? Shouldn't he be talking to God to be asking for permission to talk? Why talk to heaven and earth? And what does that mean? So one thing about these, um, when, when in this kind of biblical poetry, we use, opposites are being used, right? So here's, here's an opposite. You, you call on heaven way up high and earth down below, Usually when opposites are brought in like that, then that means everything in between. So in other words, the very first verse of the Torah, Breshit bara Elohim et hashamayim vet aretz. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, not literally just the heaven and just the earth, but it's understood to mean everything. Okay, so it's just a poetic way to say everything. God created the heaven and the earth, means God created everything. But instead of saying everything, which sounds so menial and uh, just so pedestrian, make it sound a little bit more um, uh, elevated in language by saying heaven and earth. So here too, you can apply that same reasoning. Why is Moses saying uh, heaven and earth? Because he's calling to everything in nature. Everything around should be uh, uh, giving permission for Moses to talk. Now, I, I wanted to look, before I get to below the line, I decided to, to bring out today, those of us who are in the, the Friday morning Torah class, the Commentator's Bible, which has the um, translation of the medieval, the traditional medieval commentaries. And I wanted to read what Rashi and Ibn Ezra and what the below the line, the additional comments have to say about this. And then I'll get to the below the line in the Eitz Chaim. So Rashi is the traditional 
commentator that everyone looks to when you're thinking about reading the Torah with it, the commentaries. You, you go to Rashi first, because Rashi is the classic commentator. He, he made the Torah accessible for, for study because not only did he provide a translation or the simple meaning of the text, but he also would bring forward the traditional rabbinic midrash, the traditional rabbinic commentary, so that uh, if you're studying Torah with, if you, the, the tradition is to, to study the, the, the weekly Torah reading a couple of times uh, during the week before Shabbat to be prepared for it. So you're supposed to read it straight through without commentary and then read it also with the commentary. So if you're just reading Rashi, then you're getting a taste of um, some uh, the, the, the rabbis from the time of the mission of the Talmud, their commentary, because he'll quote them. And it's only based on the, the addition of Humash that you're using that it will quote, it will have in parentheses where he's getting the quote from. Rashi didn't do that himself when he wrote the commentary. So his later critical additions that would, would, would uh, apply that. So, so reading Rashi, he has a lengthy commentary to this first verse of this portion. So, so Barbara, I know you have the book. Uh, you can turn to page 215 if you haven't found it already. And that's where I am on the left-hand side. Give ear, O heavens, dot, 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 let the earth hear. So, for I am giving Israel fair warning. This is what uh, Rashi is saying, Moses is saying. Moses is saying, I'm giving Israel fair warning because, okay, let me, let me step back. The purpose of the poem is to this, um, the, it's 43 sentences of the poem and then it's nine extra verses that make up the whole portion. The 43 sentence poem is kind of a summary of the book of Deuteronomy in that convincing the people that God is there, God loves us, we should follow the covenant, and providing um, warning of punishment and curses that would befall us if we uh, fail to follow the covenant. So you have all of that in 43 sentences. Okay, so there's warning that's included in the poem. So, so Rashi again, for I am giving Israel fair warning, and you, heaven and earth, are witnesses of it, as I told them you would be. And why did he make the heavens and the earth witness to this? Moses said, I am flesh and blood and may die tomorrow, which in the scheme of things, the next portion is Vezot Abracha, and he dies in the next portion. If the Israelites say, we do not accept the covenant, who will come and refute them? I'm dead. Moses is saying, uh, I'll be dead. I can't, I can't say, but wait a second, you had a promise. The heavens and earth now can refute the people of Israel, they said, we do not accept the covenant. That's why God made the heavens and the earth witness it, for they exist forever. So if you're going to have a contract, which the covenant is, you need witnesses to the, to the contract, two witnesses. And if you're going to have two witnesses, who are the best witnesses? Heaven and earth who are eternal. And more, Rashi goes on, if the Israelites deserve reward, it will be the witnesses who give it to them. All right, so that's interesting. The rewards are going to come from heaven and earth, rain and, and productive fields. The vine shall produce its fruit. The ground shall produce its yield. And the sky shall provide their moisture. Uh, with a, the verse from Zechariah to highlight where reward comes from. And if they deserve punishment, let the hands of the witnesses be the first against him to put him to death. He will shut up. the. So in other words, the, the, the punishments will also be from heaven and earth, that there won't be rain and there will, the uh, fields will not yield its produce. So he will shut up the sky so that there will be no rain and the ground will not yield its produce, after which you will soon perish from the good land that the Lord is assigning to you from, uh, uh, from Deuteronomy 11 at the hands of the other nations, right? So they'll be, they'll be uh, dying at the hands of the other nations, but also because heaven and earth who are witnessing this covenant will see that the Israelites are not following the covenant and therefore they're going to uh, punish them. So according to Rashi based, uh, normally he, Rashi doesn't usually uh, come up with these ideas himself. He's bringing forward Midrash, um, the rabbis who have said this before him.
So that's why heaven and earth are called to be witnesses here, because reward and punishment come from heaven and earth, and heaven and earth are eternal. Okay. Now, Ibn Ezra offers something a little bit different. So Rashi is from um, the Alsace-Lorraine region of France, Germany. Um, so when he was when he was living there, he was living in France, and there often he would have French words in his commentary, uh, especially in the uh, Talmudic commentary that he wrote as well. And French scholars have uh, been able to learn a lot about uh, how French was spoken a thousand years ago, based on French found in Rashi's commentary. Ibn Ezra is from Spain about 100 years after Rashi. Now, Ibn Ezra read Rashi. Um, and uh, so the, these rabbinic texts uh, were passed around rabbinical academies and Jewish communities, both Ashkenazi, Rashi being Ashkenazi, and Sephardi, Spanish community, um, back and forth. So uh, it, not a surprise that Ibn Ezra would have read Rashi. Um, and so now Ibn Ezra says, give ear. As I explain in my book, Sefer Mosnaim, which the footnote says is a grammatical work, this is indeed the noun ear turned into a verb as, is, as if calling on heavens to lend an ear to the following words. Okay, so Ibn Ezra often adds grammatical insight onto the words. O oh, heavens, I have already pointed out that Sa'adya understands heavens here to be an invocation of the angels. Okay. Ibn Ezra from the Sephardi tradition is more connected to the Babylonian tradition and to those rabbis who were still living in Babylonia. By Ibn Ezra's time, the rabbinic community had really left Babylonia. But a hundred or so years before him, there were still chief rabbis living in Babylonia. And uh, kind of as the seat of the Muslim empire, like uh, in Baghdad, which was the capital of the Muslim empire. And as the Muslim empire expanded through Southern Europe and Northern Africa, so did the Jewish community, ending up in Spain. So Ibn Ezra will often refer to great rabbis who came before him who were in Babylonia. One of them was Saadia Gaon, Saadia the Gaon, the chief rabbis were known as Gaon. So uh, just a little bit of history here. The, the Talmudic per period ended in Babylonia around the year 500. From 500 until about 900, 1,000, the chief rabbis were known as Gaonim, a plural of Gaon, like a, a wise one, a great sage. That's what Gaon means, like the Gaon of Vilna, in the 1700s, um, that, that appellation first was to the chief rabbis of Babylonia. We have Amram Gaon in the 700s, 800s. Uh, as a, there's Hai Gaon, uh, Hei Yud, and there's Saadia Gaon, who's known for his uh, philosophical works. So Ibn Ezra quotes Saadia Gaon a lot. So and so he's quoting Saadia Gaon as saying, when Moses is, is calling for the heavens to listen, he's really calling to the angels to listen. Because how can clouds listen? How can air listen? It could, must be the beings up in heaven that are, that are being called to listen. And that's what Saadia Gaon suggests, that he's calling to the angels in heaven to be listening. And the earth... So, uh, Ibn Ezra continues, Saadia takes this to refer to the people who live on earth. So he's calling to angelic beings, which are, which have human form up in heaven, and people down below to be witnesses. So then, Ibn, so that's another idea. So you have Rashi's idea of what heaven and earth means here. And you have Ibn Ezra's idea, quoting Saadia, angels versus people. And then he goes on, alternatively, the combination would refer to the rain, which falls from heaven, and the earth as giver of produce. So you have rain being the concrete object to be the witness, and the earth as the giver of produce. 
In my view, Ibn Ezra goes on, the point of invoking heaven and earth as witnesses is that they exist forever, just like Rashi said. See similarly, hear you mountains, the case, <coughs> the case of the Lord, you firm foundations of the earth from uh, Micah. Joshua did the same when he said to the people, see this very stone shall be a witness against us, for it heard all the words that the Lord spoke to us. I have previously suggested to you that the soul, being intermediary between the upper worlds and the lower, casts everything imaginatively in the form of the palace in which it dwells, even to the extent of imagining itself as a dweller in the palace. So lower things are brought higher in this way, and higher things are brought lower. So perhaps he's talking in a kind of mystical kind of way when Moses is saying, uh, give ear, O heavens, let the earth hear. Perhaps it's to our own souls that are both up in heaven and down on earth at the same time. So interesting ideas here. Now, uh, in looking at the additional comments below, we just have to do one thing. So, ha'azinu ha'shamayim v'adabei rav v'tishma ha'aretzim reifi. For those who know the Bible pretty well and might have been reminded of a haftarah from earlier in the book of Deuteronomy, if you look, if you have the Eitz Chaim, look at the haftarah on page 1000 for the uh, haftarah for the first portion of Deuteronomy. Or whatever chumash you're using, just turn to the haftarah for the portion Deuteronomy. It's taken from the first chapter of Isaiah. It's um, and the second verse says, "Shimu shamayim v'ha'azinu eretz." So page one thousand, verse two, "Shimu shamayim v'ha'azinu eretz." Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Okay, so for Isaiah, Shimu, Lishmoa, is connected to Shamayim, and Ha'azinu is connected to Eretz. Whereas Moses on 1185 says, Ha'azinu, Shamayim, and Tishma, Eretz. So, in other words, it might sound better to do it like Isaiah does because the, the Shimu Shamayim, Shin Shin, Ha'azinu Eretz, Aleph Aleph. That could be the reason why Isaiah does Shimu Shamayim, Ha'azinu Eretz. They're essentially the same word. It's listen or listen, hear or hear. Ozen Ha'azinu means ear. So Shimu or Ha'azinu, it's the same word. So essentially, it doesn't matter. But Isaiah thought, sounds better, Shimu Shamayim. Hazinu Eretz, Shin, Shin, Aleph, Aleph. But Moses instead does Aleph, Shin, Shin, Aleph, Hazinu, Hashamayim, Tishma, Haaretz. Okay, so the question then now for commentaries would be why? Why not keep it the same? Either do it Isaiah's way, Shimu, Shamayim, Hazinu, Eretz. Or do it Moses' way, Hazinu Shamayim Tishma Haaretz. Why did Isaiah switch it? That's the question. Okay? Is there something different about Hazinu than there is about Tishma to listen? So Shimu Shamayim Hazinu Haaretz. Okay. So the, um, the uh, additional comment. Uh, below the uh, uh, down on the bottom of 215 in in this edition suggests uh, and this is a commentary known as the Bahur Shur who that's the name of his book a lot of the commentaries <clears throat> a lot of the the authors are known by their book so Bahur Shur was Joseph Ben Isaac from northern France about 200 years after Rashi as a younger contemporary and student of Rashbam, his comments, like those of his teacher, focus on the straightforward sense of the text. Okay, so straightforward sense. Straightforward sense would then mean, oh, I see a verse in Deuteronomy, but I remember that verse from Isaiah. Oh, why is one have one order and one does the why does the other have a different order? 
Sh should there be something significant about that, or is it simple style difference? So Bechor Shor says, I, uh, give ear, O heavens, let me speak, let the earth hear the words I utter. One says, give ear to someone far away, and hear to someone nearby, as Moses, standing on earth, does hear. Okay, so if that's the case, that makes sense. Heaven is a lot farther away than earth from the perspective of a human being who's standing on earth and not up in the clouds. So then, according to Bohor Shor, this makes sense for Moses to say, the far away, Ha'azinu, and the close up, Tishma Aretz. Okay, so far, so good. But now he says, in Isaiah 1-2, which we just said, where it says, Shimu Shamaim, right? But Shimu, for close by, what does he say? Shimu, for the far away, Shamaim, where the prophet is calling on them to hear something spoken by the Lord, the opposite is naturally true. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Ah, so he, that's what he's saying is different, that in Isaiah, the idea is that he's quoting God, and God is far away, and so where the prophet is calling on the people to hear something spoken by the Lord, the opposite is naturally true. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Okay, so that's what he's saying here. Moses isn't necessary. Moses is speaking for himself, speaking to the heavens. Isaiah is quoting God, and therefore reverse the order that way. Okay, now, after Bahor's comment, we have a different comment from somebody named Chizkuni, and Chizkuni is Rabbi Chizkia ben Manoach from 13th century France. So 150 years after Bechor Shur. Um, and usually he analyzes Rashi's commentary. So he says, some say the opposite. For Moses was more at home in the heavens than on earth. And Isaiah was speaking from his own earthly perspective. And note that heavens are plural because, as our sages tell us, there are seven of them. Right, Shamayim is a plural word. Why is it a plural word? Because there are lots of heavens. Okay, that's, that's an aside. But he's just saying that maybe Moses is up in the heavens and, that's, and we should understand it differently. Be that as it may, we get a sense now what the commentaries are doing, that they, they, they they take these words very seriously. It isn't just a matter of style. It's more than that. This is a religious text. And if it's in a particular order, it has to mean something. It's not just random. And I, uh, for me to say that Isaiah liked how Shimu Shamayim sounds, because it's two shins in a row, and that if you're, I remember, prophets are talking to people um, who, are, who are just listening to the prophets. So orators use a variety of skills to, uh, or techniques to make what they're saying uh, penetrate more. So if you're going to do an alliteration like that, that it would make more sense. Shimu shamaim ha'zinu eretz. So shin shin aleph aleph makes sense for an orator. But for that, that's not good enough for a rabbinic commentary. It has to be more significant than that. Um, okay. So now then the last comment from here, the additional comments on this is from a Barbanel. Uh, a Barbanel is from Spain. Just one second, just reading the biographies here. Uh, Don Isaac, a Barbanel from 1400s, born Portugal, fled Spain, uh, died in Italy, prominent politician and financier in the Iberian Peninsula until the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492. His writings mostly date from his Italian period. So after being expelled, then he wrote his commentary. So he was alive for another 16 years uh, after the expulsion from Spain. So he says, another possibility is to interpret heavens and earth as referring to the high leaders and the low, lowly masses. <clears throat> so Hazinu Shamayim isn't literally the heavens, but the leaders of the people, the high and mighty in the community. And 
Tishma Haaretz are the riffraff, everybody else. Um, note that Moses addresses the heavens directly and presumes that the silent earth will be listening also. Right? So Ha'azinu is in a form of, of a command talking directly to the heavens. Tishma, third person, the earth should listen. Not, not listen earth, but the earth should listen as opposed to heavens listen, talking directly to heaven. So that's an interesting point too that he says. So I wanted to bring all that up about the first verse. And now if we look just at out the below the line on Eitz Chaim, it says the following. This is the last part of the Torah that's read at services on Shabbat morning, right? So this coming Shabbat, last time we read from the Torah on Shabbat in the weekly cycle, is this one, because the last portion we just read on Simcha Torah. We don't read it uh, on, we never read that last portion on a Shabbat. So the Shabbat after Ha'azinu is the Shabbat during Sukkot, that has a separate reading, and the Shabbat after that is Shabbat Breshit. So just note, just uh, that's the commentary is pointing out to us, Zod Bracha is never read on Shabbat morning in synagogue. Um, it consists entirely of a poem reprising and summarizing the themes of the first section of Deuteronomy, the greatness and generosity of God, and the stubbornness and unreliability of the Israelites. Now, give ear, O heavens, let the earth hear. Listen to me, you spiritual people whose thoughts are in heaven, and also you down-to-earth people whose concerns are more material. This message is meant for all of you, and that's from the Khatam Sofer, who's the 1800s in Hungary. So his take is that these are different kind of people that Moses is talking, is talking to, not, not uh, like our Barvanel Bar talking about leaders and non-leaders. Khatam Sofer, Sofer takes it a different way, more spiritual people, saintly people and more materialistic people and that everybody so the saintly people are up in the heavens the materialistic people down to earth everybody together it's this this covenant this poem uh expressing the covenant is for all people not just the saintly not just the materialistic but for everybody together yes jim Okay, so thinking about hearing and listening and the the words. So then I kind of wonder about the Shema. Uh -huh. right? And so is that for just kind of the everyday folk or is it for everyone? Is it uh, for those that are not spiritual or uh, everyone? Okay. That's a good question. And I think the question about um, two different groups of people arise only because we have two words here. Okay, so the Shema is one word in one line. It's not a poem. It's a command that we need to uh, listen and acknowledge that God is one. So it's not written in poetry form. The, uh, the poetic form here gives rise to this more uh, uh, homiletical uh, uh, explanation that Abarbanel had uh, that Saadia had of the speaking to the angels versus people on earth or uh, saintly and non-saintly people, it gives rise to that kind of interpretation. Okay, so I um, so the Shema, you can make that argument possibly about who, who Moses is speaking to, but it's clear um, that Moses is speaking to everyone. And here, this just lends itself. You might think that maybe God, Moses is only speaking to the spiritually inclined. No, he's speaking to those people who have their heads in the clouds and also who have their heads on earth. Okay, so, but this is the nature of rabbinic commentaries on poems like this, when you have synonyms like this, that... Um, you, uh, it leads the rabbis to uh, have the opportunity to come up with a more uh, spiritual kind of interpretation of the text. There's no law. None of the 613 mitzvot are derived from this poem. So the commentary here is all about coming up with spiritual uh, meaning as opposed to law. 
Um, and um, okay, so we'll, um, it's a quarter to 12, so we'll stop here for today. Um, so again, next two weeks, no class because they're both Yontav, second day of Sukkot. Next week, Simcha Torah the following week. So we'll meet again three weeks from today, first Wednesday in October, uh, in which we will uh, be discussing the portion uh, Noah. So have, a, have an easy and meaningful fast. Uh, and Gemar uh, Chatimatova, may we be uh, inscribed and sealed in the Book of Life for health and blessing this coming year. Thank you and your family too. Thank I have one you. question. Yes, Rita. Uh, Susan asked me approximately when would we be doing the partisan song, and I told her about three, three thirty. Oh no, no, uh, no, uh, much earlier than that. Much earlier than that. Oh, earlier. Okay. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's still part of Musaf. It'll be about uh, probably about um, uh, twelve thirty, one o'clock. Something like that. Oh, so it's right after Yisker, probably. Not right after, because after Yisker, then we have the repetition. We have uh, the Avoda service. Um, oh. Oh, so yeah, okay. yeah. So it's more like uh, uh, around one o'clock. Are you going to give the introduction to the uh, partisan song? Yes, uh, yes. And, okay. And okay. translation? Should uh, I... So I don't have that. No, you'll just sing okay. it. I'll, okay, I'll give the translation then. Uh, uh, or maybe I'll read the translation before you sing. Okay, good. Okay. 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 Thank you. All okay. right. Have a Gamarto. good day. Gamarto. 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 Gamarto.